सो हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू सोनी आई एस होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग ग्रेट एंड प्रिपेयरिंग वेरी हार्ड फॉर द अपकमिंग सी एस ई प्रेम्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री नाउ द स्मॉल सेशन इज पार्ट ऑफ योर ऑन गोइंग शून्य आई एस क्रैश कोर्स फॉर प्रेम्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड विल बी डीलिंग हेयर विद मॉडर्न इंडियन विच इज़ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट एसेंशियल टॉपिक्स सो Uh, the crash course which has been planned which is ongoing right now in online and offline mode by Shunya IAS it have, will for modern indian history will have uh, 10 lectures in total and uh, this is the worksheet discussion uh, for lecture number 1 now uh, here we'll be discussing some of the questions uh, which will help you to further Uh, get a basic understanding of what kind of questions will be asked uh, we can't obviously will assure you that these these questions will only be asked but this will give you a basic idea that look these type of questions these types of topics have to be given more importance while preparing okay so i hope you have already joined the sessions uh, lecture series and have gone through the lecture number 1 and then come and attend this worksheet discussion so the first lecture was pretty good uh, it well very fine i hope you have seen it already uh, it was decline of mogal empire and the beginning of european settlement these topics uh, are somewhat very much from your ncrts and uh, a lot of questions are expected from these topics so let's begin with our discussion uh, the very first question we have to look here is the consider the following statements about mughal revenue collection system during the later mughal age now later mughal age is 1707 onwards always keep this thing in mind that later mughals are the all the rulers after the six initial mughals who are also called as the great mughals from babar to aurangzeb okay now the first statement talk about the mansabdari system worked efficiently as long as aurangzeb was in power now here let me tell you these things very specifically that uh, instead of just instead of just focusing on the rulers or date line okay you have to focus more on the economy society in society specifically about the situation of women education level these are the th kind of thing which are given more importance nowadays even by the upsc so here you will see that no dates are asked the question has been framed in such a manner that if you have the basic understanding you will be able to answer so the first statement ask you the mansabdari system worked efficiently as long as aurangzeb was in power now in this is something which is expected of you that you must be knowing otherwise also in the classes we have discussed that aurangzeb actually started facing the difficulty in 1670 onward on the tax collection path now mansabdari system had its issues crises from the time of shah jahan himself in the time of aurangzeb we have seen that when he took over deccan after 1680s you will see that he started putting their salaried employees okay for collection of tax so this tells you what that he must have understood that the mansabdari system is corrupt enough that it shouldn't be considered any more the main way of collection of revenue from the mogal subas so the first statement is wrong okay now the second statement the izare dari system was introduced during the reign of farukh shiar now uh, just for information farukh shiar came in power in 1713 and ruled till 1719 izare dari system was already there in the mogal revenue collection system mentioned okay in the main systems the main ideas which were uh, explained in the Mug revenue systems of the moguls izare dari system was already there but no great moguls ever tried to use this system. because everyone knew what the havoc it can create izare dari system was the basic system in which all the aspiring uh zamindars jagirdars were called in and they were asked that how much revenue you can collect and a bidding process used to take place whoever assured the government that they can collect the maximum amount of revenue they were given the, the izara that is the piece of land to collect the revenue now where the is people are going to collect the revenue from they are going to use all the brutal exploitative techniques to 
fetch as much money from the people okay and the, over the period what will happen these people will have a disliking towards the state and the sense of nationalism will be gone so great moguls till aurangzeb never used izaradari system although this statement is also wrong because izaradari system was used for the first time during the reign of jahandar shah jahandar shah ruled for a mere amount of 1 year between 1712 and 1713 when bahadur shah first passed away okay even jahandar shah himself was not responsible for izaradari system it was actually implemented by his prime minister whose name was zulfikar khan okay so the second statement is also wrong the mansabdari system and izaradari system were introduced in the mughal administrative system during the reign of akbar this is something i have kind of told you that i haven't mentioned the name of akbar but i have just told you few minutes back that look mansabdari and izaradari both were there in the tax revenue systems of the moguls it was actually introduced at the time of akbar by todermal in 1581 okay so the third statement is right rest of the two are wrong okay so only three three only that is the d statement is correct for this one let's move forward this was about economy about the last part of mughal times which of the following were the initial reasons for the decline of mughal empire now for this topic let me remind you again that even if you are preparing and if you are in the revision state make sure that you go through your old ncert okay don't go for any other book before going through your old ncert bipin chandra okay and for these kind of question regarding the declining phase of mughal empire you have to go through old ncert bipin chandra chapter number 1 the last 3 pages will give you enough information okay just the 3 pages i am telling you to read that's it so uh, which of the following were the initial reasons for the decline of mughal empire inefficient and corrupt taxation system uh, overstretched mughal resources in deccan continuous foreign invasion from the northwest and infighting among the native nobility in the mughal court these are the four statement we have to check them one by one now these things i have discussed in great detail in the class i hope if you have uh, attended the lecture if you have already seen the lecture in video format or online mode or you have attended the offline sessions you must be knowing the answer already but let me explain for everyone else and if you want to revise also that uh, what were the main initial reasons for the decline of mughal empire so initial decline started in 1670 1680 1680 onwards after the moguls started expanding into deccan into the maratha region their resources were extensively used in deccan and that created so much stress on the mughal exchequer the mughal toshkhana that they started facing difficulties overstretched mughal resources in the deccan is surely one of the reason inefficient and corrupt taxation system i have just told you in last uh, question that it was also one of the reason that is true continuous foreign invasion from northwest now we know very well that northwest invasion have happened not once uh, one big one was from nadir shah in 1739 and then one famous one during panipat in 1761 but we also know that panipat was not the only invasion by ahmed shah abdali abdali had continuously invaded indian territories between 1748 and 1767 not once but many times so much so was the threat of abdali ali that uh, uh, even in the ruler of bengal okay and back in 1756 1757 was afraid mushid after the demise of mushid when the whole bengal was threatened you will see that siraj ud daula uh, actually went back from calcutta to Mushidabad his his original capital only because he was threatened from an afghan invasion so afghans were a reality so does it mean that the continuous foreign invasion from northwest became the reason for decline of mughal empire this is totally true but the question you have to read again the question is asking initial reasons now this is true that the foreign invasions from the northwest have created a chaotic period chaotic time okay and have actually pushed the mughal revenue mughal exchequer system in such a uh, dampening situation from where rising up was impossible but it was not a initial reason 
initial reason why because the situation already became so worse in agra and delhi that the rulers in from northwest whether it was persian ruler nadir shah or afghan durani tribesmen led by ahmed shah abdali all of them were able to enter indian territories because the mughals were already impoverished so the statement is not the initial reason surely it's a reason but it's not a initial reason which has been asked fine so in fighting among the native nobility in the mughal court now you need to understand that this is statement is false because of a different reason if the coach statement would have been given that in fighting among the nobility in the mughal court that would have been totally correct there were turanis uh, afghanis iranis uh, uzbeks kazakhs all these people from all around the place as well as hindustanis who okay who were part of the mughal nobility but the native nobility was only the hindustanis surely the hindustanis were in a difficult situation fighting with different factions in the mughal court afghani irani turani but they were not fighting among themselves or that was surely not the reason for the uh, issue in the mughal court okay so because of this word native this statement is also wrong if this word native would have not been there this statement would have been right so you have to be very peculiar about what exactly the statement is demanding you as was the case here and also what the statement is trying to say so the third and the fourth statements are wrong and only one and two are right so option c is correct fine let's move forward to the third question you can see here that how precisely the questions have been framed so to give you a reminder of upsc will do this for sure answer the following statement about provincial authorities in the mughal era murshid kuli khan got the hereditary subedari right from farukhshiar okay kulich khan got the hereditary subedari right from mohammad shah rangila and bharatpur got independence during the reign of aurangzeb now which of them are correct now murshid kuli khan who was the subedar of bengal in the reign of farukhshiar he actually got the hereditary subedari from farukhshiar in 1717 immediately after farukhshiar gave the golden farman in favor of the british east india company and allowed the company to continue the trade in bengal with the just the annual payment of 3000 rupees which was which was set up by uh, shah suja back in 1651 mushid was very upset with the central leadership with farukhshiar and to make sure that there are no more difficulties in relationship between murshid and farukhshiar farukhshiar gave murshid hereditary subedari for those students who don't know what's hereditary subedari it basically means that the governorship will be from the same family your son will be being made subedar that is governor after you and his son after that okay in simple word kilich khan is actually for those students who don't know is the whole name of nizam ul mulk ashaf jahan kilich khan okay his name was chin kilich khan so these things can be done by upsc or c also so you have to be very crystal clear that nizam ul mulk ashaf jahan chin kilich khan who was from the persian ancestry was actually initially made nizamul mulk that is the prime minister of the mughal sultanate by mohammad shah rangila somewhere around 1720 1721 but subsequently when he felt threatened and he saw that there might be a situation where he will also be killed just like uh, in the past twice the prime ministers were so he himself demanded from mohammad shah rangila that he should be given the subedari of deccan and he became the subedar of deccan and all the territories south of narmada for the in charge for all the territories south of narmada for the mughals and he established himself in hyderabad okay and that's where the ashaf jahan dynasty evolved 1724 onward and they existed till 
1948 okay september 13 1948 that's the very dynasty which was removed now this statement is also right the first one is right bharatpur got its independence during the reign of aurangzeb this is also actually very correct because students get confused when students always think that it was only after demise of aurangzeb that uh, the small small principalities started getting their independence but no people you have to remember that aurangzeb in his last phase spended most of his time in deccan and when he was in deccan the small principalities started rising up because the nobilities of the mughal were already fighting among themselves so bharatpur was able to declare its independence back in 1695 itself aurangzeb passed away in 1707 so he was the ruler of agra delhi all of north india so basically third statement is also correct so all of them are correct so can you see this thing if you can analyze that how specifically they are framing the questions let's move to the next question consider the following statement agriculture was no more remained profitable source of revenue mughal rajput schism during aurangzeb reign and addition of new jagirs okay jagirs increased this satisfaction this satisfaction among nobility which of the statement are reason for decline of mughal empire now again decline of mughal empire okay this is very important thing so there are three different statements agriculture was no more uh, the section remained no more profitable source of revenue that's the first statement then the second statement is mughal rajput schism during aurangzeb reign and the third one is addition of new jagirs increased this satisfaction among nobility now let me tackle one by one each of them this is again discussed in the classroom already in the first chapter first lecture so agriculture was no more remained profitable this statement is actually right because for the very first time the overall population of mughal sultanate increased from 15 crore beyond and with so much such a huge population no more agriculture was uh, giving surplus which could use to increase the revenue of the state and so under this condition you need to understand that the first statement is right for those students who don't know the word uh, schism schism means divide in a sense okay divides or separation going on opposite side that what schism means mughal rajput schism happened during the reign of aurangzeb okay always remember till shah jahan was alive mughals and rajput maintain good relations but aurangzeb never gave much importance to the rajputs and when he was in power they were sidelined one after other except jaising all the rajputs were sidelined now uh you need to understand that what happened after this because they were sidelined they stopped providing the natural protection on the western front which was very beneficial for the moguls as long as the rajputs were there in the fighting forces of the moguls moguls and rajput combinedly were far superior than any other fighting force which could have tried to enter the indian subcontinent from the northwest as have happened from the ancient times it was only after the rajputs left the mughal regiments you will see that 17 1739 nadir shah happened and subsequently then spree of looting happened in the area led by the afghan tribesmen mostly by ahmed shah abdali so the second statement is also something you can say to be correct addition of new jagirs okay now this statement is wrong because that was actually one of the biggest problem among the nobilities because almost almost all the land was already already given in form of jagir form of jagis so all the land was already given in form of jagis to different different groups different different people and so there was nothing left to be given to the nobility any more and so actually the nobility was dissatisfied because there was less jagis okay there was no more increment in jagis there was actually reduction in jagis okay so the third statement is wrong so fourth one uh, b which contains one and two only okay one and two that is the right answer fourth b option now 
फिफ्थ क्वेश्चन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज ट्रू अबाउट द पोर्तुगीज इन इंडिया सो वी डिस्कस्ड हाफ ऑफ द फर्स्ट सेक्शन ऑफ द चैप्टर आर लेक्चर दैट वॉज द डिक्लाइन ऑफ मुगल एम्पायर नाउ लेट्स मूव टू द नेक्स्ट पार्ट वेर वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द राइज ऑफ और बेसिकली कमिंग इन ऑफ द यूरोपियन कंपनीज इन इंडिया द सेटलिंग अप ऑफ यूरोपियन कंपनीज सो एक्चुअली द फर्स्ट वन यूरोपियन हु केम टू इंडिया वर पोर्तुगीज वास्को डिगामा वॉज द फर्स्ट टू कम इन फोर्टीन नाइन्टी एट थ्रू कैलिकट and the question is about portuguese only so which of the following statement is true uh, about portuguese in india okay now statement was he said goa acted as a capital of all portuguese territories in the east the statement actually is correct because look it was not that portuguese were not capable of uh, getting into hinterland in india deep down deep inside india no they were actually initially not interested and they took over the eastern coast of africa they took over the west coast or nearby region in india and they also took over the coastal area of indonesia and southeast asia fine and for this region they developed they called it astado estado di india and they made goa as the capital of whole estado de india that means from right from zanzibar till jakarta which was back then called batavia which later went into the hands of the dutch was controlled from this very area so goa acted as capital of all portuguese territory in the east this statement is right moguls accepted the supremacy of portuguese in high seas on indian ocean and arabian sea now From 1510, Francisco de Almeida was the Portuguese governor who came up with one for a policy called as the Blue Water Policy. This Blue Water Policy talked about the supremacy of the Portuguese naval forces over the blue waters. Blue waters means high seas, not the coastal seas, the high seas. Okay, means for example, if you are going from Mangalore to Mangalore to Kochi, that will be a coastal shipping. But suppose if you are going from Mangalore to Zanzibar, that's on the African East Coast, that will be high seas. Okay, so they controlled all the high seas, fifteen hundred and ten onwards, until sixteen hundred and twelve. So in this period, even the Mughals, the mighty Mughals who came to India only in fifteen twenty six, they were forced to follow the commandments of the Portuguese, and even when they were sending their representatives to Hajj, okay, to Mecca, then also they have to get the permissions of the Portuguese, and Portuguese used to issue them a papers called as cardsard, and they have to get this cardsard with them, and then only they could travel through the seas. Okay, so this statement is also. correct portuguese maintained religious neutrality in india now this the thing can be more wrong than this statement portuguese were continuously wanted or tried to influence the uh, indian society and uh, you will see that in line with the treaty of tordesillas which they have signed in 1494 they went on to use all their capabilities to expand catholic christianity okay in india so on the west coast of india you will see more than uh, so many churches are there okay those are initially made by the cath uh, christ uh, the support of the portuguese who were sitting in goa uh, the for example uh, coming of saint uh, xavier's to india that was also in line that was also supported by the portuguese so and later on also in goa they took steps to convert as many the native indians um, into catholic christianity so nowhere portuguese maintained religious neutrality in india frankly no european powers maintained complete uh, religious neutrality in india although if you compare all of them in comparison to the portuguese french dutch actually english were the one who were most interested in trade and only very few of them were interested in propagating the word of christianity in india okay although they also did it i'm not saying that they were not at, not at all revolved in religious uh, uh, propagation so statement 3 is wrong 1 and 2 is the answer uh, question 5 a question 6 which of the following is true about the dutch east india company dutch east india company okay they had no inland factories okay 
Now, this sounds absurd. Understand this thing. Suppose you don't know where exactly Dutch factories are were, and I totally understand. Sometimes gets difficult to remember all the factories of all the companies. But you need to understand that factories were just trading stations, and if the Dutch were trading throughout the Indian subcontinent, it is absurd and it's frankly impossible not to maintain trading centers. in the important trading towns in india okay there has to be trading centers in patna there has to be trading center in agra okay there has to be there trading center in baharampur if you are not maintaining trading center in these cities how you are going to trade in the mainland india only by coastline you cannot trade suppose you are purchasing some material from peshawar what are you going to take that material direct from peshawar to kolkata no you will take the material and keep it somewhere close by maybe delhi maybe lahore somewhere you have to have a factory over there so even if you suppose you don't know this question okay then also you can mark this one wrong dutch focus in the eastern world was indian subcontinent only now this one is also wrong we know very well that the dutch focus in the eastern world was actually the island of java basically the whole of indonesia what we now now know as jakarta the city jakarta was basically called as batavia and just like chennai bombay kolkata the important indian cities were initially established by the britishers similarly jakarta was also established by the dutch okay so dutch focus in eastern world was indian subcontinent no that statement is also wrong okay now Dutch traded with natives using barter system. This is very well known. Everyone knows this that barter system was something was done extensively in the Indian subcontinent, and mostly it was done because of the threat of the Portuguese. As long as uh, Portuguese maintained a monopoly on the spice trade, and they did so, so they didn't allow the cardzard. which was actually the required paper to trade through the seas they didn't gave it to any european company if they were trading in spices okay and they maintained a monopoly till 1612 so what the dutch used to do dutch used to bring uh, spices from indonesia and the region give it to the uh, people sitting in india either the natives or the portuguese only take the money and use it to purchase silk from india and then used to take that silk to europe which was allowed for them and for that they used to get the cards art and therefore they were trading extensively in barter system in india so the third statement is right okay so question 6 is the option is c now a question about the english naval supremacy uh, because we have known this very well till 1919 the britishers were the supreme naval power okay naval power so we need to know that how it happened what was really going on so english commanded the indian coastline during the reign of queen elizabeth now if you have studied your ncrts you know it very well that in year 1600 queen elizabeth gave the charter in favor of merchant adventurers which went on to become east india company but soon only 1603 she passed away we also know that british actually won the battle of suwali and after that only they started commanding authority in indian ocean and arabian sea region that means what the first statement has to be wrong and the second statement has to be right so these both statements are interconnected the third statement english opened factory in madras to command trade in extreme south the statement is actually right we have discussed this again in detail that deep down if you make a map of india like this okay there is a place called as nagapatnam so nagapatnam was made a dutch uh, east india company's factory okay and therefore and the center for british war uh, mashli patnam which was up in north in comparison to nagapatnam so all the trade from the deep south was actually going first to nagapatnam and not going to mashli patnam and therefore the britishers decided that they have to open a new factory south of nagapatnam and therefore what happened if you will see right now there is a polycut lake 
just next to on the border of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. That north of that Polikat Lake is Nagapatnam and south of that Polikat Lake is Madras. And that's what is true here. Okay, the C statement 2 and 3 are correct. Eighth and the last question for today. Consider the following statement. Factories were the trading centers for the European companies. French East India Company was the last among the European companies to come to India and Jahangir gave trading rights to all the European companies. Now, if you have attended the lectures or you have gone through your NCRTs well enough, you will be knowing this, that actually the factories of the Europeans back in the day, you can compare them to SEZs. Special economic zone, what they call now, okay? You can compare those things to SEZs, okay? These were trading stations, okay? They used to have officials who either go into the hinterland, purchase materials from the native, brought it back to the factory, and then took it through the shipping route to the European countries. Or the natives brought their products, their produce to the factories and used to sell to the factories, to the Europeans who were sitting in the factories because the natives were getting good prices in comparison to selling in the Indian market only. Okay, so initially these was the job of the factories. These factories later on became the administrative entities, not initially. Now, so first statement is right. Now, French East India Company was the last to come to India among the Europeans. This is also correct. They, the first Europe, French, uh, star, French East India Company itself was established in 1664 and subsequently they started coming to India. So French East India Company was the last uh, after, shortly after the Portuguese and the British but even after the Dutch they came. Now Jahangir, yeah this is correct. I told you already about Battle of Suwali which was fought next to Surat between the Portuguese and the British and when the Portuguese lost in Battle of Suwali in November 1612, subsequently the British, uh, the Portuguese might on the Arabian Sea was also lost and subsequently the British became the most powerful in the region. Now, Jahangir thought that he can get benefited by this because Jahangir never gave the right to any other European company to open factories in the Mughal Empire because of the sheer threat of the Portuguese that he will not be given Karzat papers next time his ships are going into high seas. But now that the authorities of the Portuguese is no more in the in Arabian Sea, he immediately not only gave the right to open a factory in Surat for Britishers, which was finally established in 1616, but he even made it an order that each and every European company, country, whoever is coming to take or trying to trade on the coastline in India, they will be given permission. His idea was as long as all the Europeans are sitting here, they will be competing among each other. If they will be competing among each other, they will be getting giving better price for Indian traders as well as will also cut on each other businesses. So making sure that next time a monopoly won't be established. Back when Jahangir was Ula, it was not expected that one among these European countries or companies will evolve into the master of Indian subcontinent. Okay, so basically all the statements over here are correct. All of them are correct. That's D is the answer. These were some of the questions which would help you to at least analyze and understand what kind of questions are going to be asked no one is again going to ask you specifically about dates you have some basic idea about what happened the chronology is understood that is enough for you to answer most of the questions in the examination again uh, the prelims 2023 crash course is already started in online and offline mode uh, in offline modes, it's going on in our Delhi center, Bangalore and Pune center. And in off online mode, it's already available on shunyis.com. So make sure if you haven't enrolled yet, make sure to enroll as soon as possible and give your preparation a final touch. So make sure that you can crack the examination with flying colors. Thank you. That will be all. And let's catch up in the next lecture.